Released by Atlas in the year 2004 on the PlayStation 2, Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne would be the fifth installment in the mainline series, and the director's cut edition would be the first mainline installment to be released in the West. Directed by Katsuro Hashino, who would later direct Personas 3, 4, and 5, the game would undergo a few revised editions, such as the Maniacs edition, directed by Kazuyuki Yamai, where it would be released in the US to raise awareness of the Megami Tensei brand. For story, the game features a boy given the body of a demon while retaining his human heart, nicknamed Demifiend, who arbitrates the fate of the world within a post-apocalyptic Tokyo. For gameplay, the new press turn would add a layer to the normal menu-driven turn-based combat as either allies or foes may earn or lose turns to extend or lose their action phase. Skills for the player are now earned by equipping a Magatama Parasite, and a variation of a night and day cycle has an impact on several things, including the expanded demon conversation and recruitment system. In addition, dungeons are now explorable in 3D, there is a new game plus, and more faction options exist to allow the player to earn one of six different endings. Also, among the content and changes added across the Maniacs and later Maniacs Chronicle editions, Dante from Devil May Cry 2 makes a cameo appearance and may join the party. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the game begins, we see a teacher explain that per a prophecy, in order to guide the world to salvation, it must first die and then be born again. While the entire population of the world will also perish, she turns to one of her students, saying she will not only save them from such a fate, but also be the one to shape the new world too. Waking up, a boy in shorts arrives in Tokyo, getting a reminder from his friend Isamu to meet up at Yoyogi Park as they go and visit their teacher, Miss Yuko. Hearing of a deadly riot in the park recently, the boy arrives to observe a reporter complaining how the park is now closed off, and reveals that while the news claims the riot was a protest that turned violent, there is word it was actually an open struggle between two cults. The boy gets a call from another classmate, a girl named Chiaki, who says she and Isamu already went ahead to the hospital. Overhearing this, the man says he's actually on his way to the same hospital, handing the boy a copy of the occult magazine he works for, and mentions there is more going on with that hospital than they know. He introduces himself as Hajiri, author of The Ring of Gaia and the Scripture of Moroku before parting ways. Entering the hospital lobby, the boy spots Chiaki, who notes it's strange how there are no staff or patients anywhere here, and mentions Isamu went on ahead to look for their teacher. She spots Hajiri's magazine and begins to read it, as the boy goes to find their laid-back friend. Returning to Chiaki, she talks about an article in the magazine that brings up a cult of demon worshippers called the Ring of Gaia, who believe in a book of prophecy called the Scripture of Moroku, that states chaos will engulf the world. What more, the same hospital they're in now is linked to the organization, trying to bring about that world, and Isamu adds that lines up with shady rumors of deadly experiments being run here and a cult being behind it all. Sensing an urgency in finding Yuko, Isamu offers to start searching from the top floor while the boy searches the basement, and Chiaki jabs at Isamu's bluff of bravado. Finding blotches of blood and evidence of the occult, the boy stumbles into a room where a man in a chair is observing a strange drum covered in symbols. The man named Hikawa dislikes his stillness being disturbed, and openly proclaims the world will be wiped clean and reborn as the prophecy in the scripture of Moroku will come true today. He notices the boy is not one of their surviving followers from the purge in the park, and moves to kill him as a precaution, summoning a shadowy demon behind him. Just in time, Yuko intervenes, saving the boy and asking Hikawa to spare him, pointing out he is powerless to stop their plan. At first, Hikawa refuses to assume even the smallest risk, but Yuko forces his hand, and he reluctantly allows the boy to go. As he leaves, the boy is met by a small blonde boy and an elderly woman, who take a strange interest in him before leaving. On the roof of a hospital, the boy meets with Yugo, who explains they are about to witness the conception event, in which the world they know will be reborn, though everyone outside this hospital will die. She adds it is the boy's fate to live through the conception, as it is hers as the maiden to shape the new world, and promises to support the boy. With a view of the city, they witness a large ball of energy form in the sky and darken the world around it, as the surface of the old world curves upon itself to form the inside of a new spherical world, with the ball of energy as its center. The boy then hears a voice looking inside his heart and not finding something called a reason, saying that the world cannot be shaped without one. The boy then sees the little blonde boy again, as the old woman says the little boy means to give them a gift, holding them down as a parasite called a Magatama is forcibly ingested. She explains the Magatama are an essence of demonic power, and with it, the boy now has a demon body. Shirtless, with glowing tattoos and a new spike protruding from behind his neck, the newly formed Demi-Fiend wakes up in the morgue of the hospital, finding there are wandering souls and demons about. Examining a curious door, he spots Hajiri again, who is surprised to see the kid's new form, and saying the last thing he remembers was a bright light and then he was in this room. 
Trying to figure out an explanation for it all, he mentions he's seen a barrel like this belonging to a man named Hikawa and thinks that this is their lead. Seeing the Demi Fiend is strong enough to survive the demons outside, he asks his help in gathering information and seeing if anyone else survived the conception. Agreeing, the Demi Fiend heads out, only to be caught in a strange space and now before an old man and lady in black who tests his strength and is satisfied with the results, assuring the Demi Fiend they will meet again. Returning to the hospital, the Demi Fiend searches around and soon befriends a wayward pixie who wishes to return safely to Yoyogi Park nearby. Teaming up, she helps guide him out of the hospital, tricking some demons coveting something called Magatsuhi and defeating one by the exit holding on to another Magatama. Stepping outside, the Demi Fiend takes his first look at the ruined world built from the remains of old Tokyo as the old woman and child again greet him and show him the glowing ball in the sky is Kagutsuchi, who created this chaotic vortex world and whose power affects all its inhabitants. The pair leaves, but not before reminding the Demi Fiend the choice to create or destroy this world is up to them, and not far off, another pair of strangers enter the scene. First, a pair of investigators from the capital of the past, Raido Kuzunoa the 14th and Goto Doji, arrive to handle a case handed to them by the old man, though Raido chooses to stand back and observe first. At the same time, the same old man has hired Devil May Cry 2 Dante, who sets off to work immediately. Later, though the Demi Fiend and Pixie arrive at Yoyogi Park, they both agree to keep sticking together anyway, as they visit a fountain of life and meet the lady within. They then journey onward to see how the world ended with Shibuya, where shopping is still the mainstay and are introduced to the Cathedral of Shadows. Later, they visit a club to see Chiaki is there, speechless from the shock of coping with such a nightmarish world, and is surprised to learn the conception event described in the magazine is actually happening for real. Seeing her friend, despite his new form, gives her hope more people survive too, and leaves to go find them. Learning of an organization in Ginza called the Assembly of Nihilo, the Demi Fiend also finds another terminal room in Hijiri within it. He explains the terminals act as a connected network, allowing fast travel to any node across a strange passageway called the Amala Network. Figuring one of these nodes leads to Hakawa, he offers to work together with the Demi Fiend, providing information as they track Hikawa down. He adds the group in Ginza is one of those seeking to shape the world, and it's also led by a human, asking the Demi Fiend to investigate if it's Hikawa or not. Agreeing to help, Hajiri sends the Demi Fiend ahead to Ginza, but for some reason the link is disconnected and the Demi Fiend falls into the Amala network itself. With Hajiri's help, he navigates the maze and learns the red wisps around him are Magatsuhi, the raw emotions left behind that are also a form of raw power for this world. Fighting and defeating an angry specter, hungry and greedy for the Magatsuhi here, the spirit vows revenge as the Demi Fiend lands in yet another unexpected location. Peering inside a vein-like window, the Demi Fiend bears witness to a congregation of demons all applauding onto stage the old man. The Lady in Black welcomes the Demi Fiend to the farthest region of Amala called the Netherworld, but comments he is too weak to be here right now. She motions to send him to his original destination, but gifts him with a menorah, saying it will light his path to power. Arriving safely in Ginza, he learns the city is indeed under the rule of Nihilo, and while turned away from the front door, Madame Nix running a bar in Ginza advises he then seek out Gozu Tenno. The leader of demons at Ikebukuro is a rival faction in Nihilo and will likely help him infiltrate their base. Passing through a great underpass, the Demi Fiend spots the skittish and uncannily human-like folk down here calling themselves mannequins. Relieved to see the Demi Fiend is not an enemy, they explain mannequins are made in the image of humans and made to serve demons, and so hide away here. Many of them are captured and suffering as slaves to the group of demons in Ikebukuro called the Mantra. In addition, a particularly passionate collector of former human culture offers to help the Demi Fiend into Ikebukuro in exchange for an item humans often valued more than their own lives, the almighty dollar bill. Obliging, the Demi Fiend manages to continue on, but soon the flames of his menorah flicker wildly as he senses a powerful demon nearby. Thrust into a pocket domain, the Demi Fiend is met by a true fiend who says he too has a menorah and they are destined to duel to the death for their power. Revealing himself, the Matador Fiend casually reminds the Demi Fiend the importance of buffs and debuffs and a practical lesson of the press turn mechanic. Edging out a win, the Demi Fiend claims Matador's menorah and is contacted by the Lady in Black, requesting they return the menorah to them via the Labyrinth of Amala at their earliest convenience. Emerging in a cemetery where there are strange mounds of mud and mannequin clothing about, the Demi Fiend finds Ikebukuro full of demons eager for a fight, and upon finding an Amala terminal, returns the menorah. The Lady in Black thanks him and recognizes his strength, and on behalf of the old man, mentions the menorah were a part of his collection, as they are the flames of life that control the flow of Magatsuhi within the labyrinth of Amala. 
The old man asks now if the Demi-Fiend would be willing to recover all 11 menorahs taken by fiends in exchange for access to the labyrinth, and agreeing the lady adds those with menorahs tend to seek out others, so the other fiends will find him. Mentioning to light each floor of the labyrinth when able to, the pair step away, as the lady mentions to the old man that preparations are complete, and the old man smiles lightly. Returning to Ikebukuro, the Demi-Fiend spots the tall building acting as the headquarters for the mantra, and entering finds Isamu there, arguing with Thor. Seeing his friend, Isamu is in disbelief at his new appearance, quickly begging for help in regards to Yuko, but Thor knocks Isamu into a pillar. Reaching down, the demon then rips out Isamu's Magatsuhi and claims it for himself as Isamu falls unconscious. Turning to the Demi-Fiend, he accuses him of trespassing too and has him jailed where the only trial he'll get is trial by combat. Prevailing against the overzealous charges, the Demi-Fiend is soon confronted by Thor, besting him fairly and earning his respect. Thor declares the Demi-Fiend innocent and not only allows him to go freely but also invites him to meet their leader Gozu Tenno, who is building a utopia where only the strong are permitted to live. As the Demi-Fiend decides to indulge, before he climbs to the top of the building, he is observed by two visitors as Raido and Goto decide to continue observing from afar as Dante from Devil May Cry 2 makes a flashy entrance and forces a duel with the boy. As they clash, Devil Hunter smugly admits the Demi-Fiend isn't half bad, yet notices he isn't a full demon either. Dante pulls back for now, wishing to learn more about the plans his client has in mind, but assures the Demi-Fiend he can always come back and kill him. Afterwards, Goto comes out and nods in approval as he introduces them as a pair of investigators, and mentions an old man hired them to keep an eye on the appropriately named Demi-Fiend. They too insist on looking into the old man's game on their own, taking their lead, as the Demi-Fiend climbs to the top of the mantra base. A servant mannequin raises her arms to announce the giant demon statue known as Gozu Tenno, leader of the mantra, who in turn welcomes the Demi-Fiend. It shares a portion of its power with the Demi-Fiend, promising more should the Demi-Fiend choose to serve it, though the Demi-Fiend isn't totally convinced for now. Gozu Tenno brings up the Nihilo and their plan to make a world of stillness, having declared war on their reason, and having already raided their headquarters. It urges the Demi-Fiend to join in the attack and opting to check things out, the Demi-Fiend encounters another fiend who reminds him death is an inevitability and defeats him for another menorah. Heading to the Nihilo's headquarters, the Demi-Fiend sees the mantra have laid waste inside, including wrecking a device with a massive Amala drum inside. Nearby is Hijiri, who snuck in while both sides were fighting, who explains the room they're in is actually a facility for collecting Makatsuhi, however, it's no longer operational thanks to the assault. But, Hajiri noticed when he arrived that the flow of Makatsuhi is very off here, and realizes this may actually be a well-made decoy. The real core is somewhere else in the base, and he's willing to bet Hikawa is not too far. Collecting keys in a maze within the flow, the Demi-Fiend finds Hikawa within the real core, surprised to see the boy alive, and content to answer his questions. He begins by explaining Magatsuhi is not only a power that permeates the world, it is also intended as a sacrificial offering. With enough Magatsuhi collected, a god of creation may be called down and reshape the world based on the ideology, or reason, of the person who wills it. The plan to end the world in order to remake it was his, and his ideal world, named Shijima, will be one of stillness and equality, with a lack of conflict or the complications of individuality. As the mantra compete towards their own ideology and have failed to defeat his, Hikawa now activates his hidden weapon, the Nightmare System, casting an effect on the mantra headquarters that begins rapidly absorbing all of the Magatsuhi in the area, dealing a devastating blow. Hikawa adds the system also gives him control over the flow of Magatsuhi on a worldwide scale, and with their Magatsuhi depleted, the mantra will die in no time. He then mentions Yuko and her invaluable role as the Maiden, and voices his regret in letting the boy live when they first met. He leaves for now, dropping a demon guard behind him, and though the Demi-Fiend triumphs, the demon guard spits out there is no way to follow Hikawa or the Maiden. Returning to the mantra's base, the Demi-Fiend finds Chiaki there, who shares that she now embraces the ways of this chaotic world. Ever since she learned the purpose of this world is to create a new one, she declares she will be the one to do it, as she believes the old world was congested and stagnant, in a hurry to go nowhere. As a survivor of the conception, she also believes herself to be a chosen one, and mentions she also heard a voice in the beginning, asking for her choice. Now, she has decided her ideal society is named Yosuga, a purposeful one, ruled by the strong and worthy, and where the useless are purged. Though the Demi-Fiend does not initially agree, Chiaki is confident in his pursuit of power, he'll come to the same conclusion as her. She turns to begin gathering strength in Magatsuhi on her own, while the Demi-Fiend hurries to find out what happened to Isamu. Freeing prisoners along the way, the mannequins share their leader, the prophet Futomimi, is still held captive elsewhere, and just beyond is Isamu, alive but not exactly well. 
He heard Yuko as the Nihilo's maiden and thought the Demi-Feed would have rescued her, but sees that isn't the case. Isamu recounts how the mantra are defeated, the Nihilo has nearly won, and their teacher is still missing. Frustrated, Isamu thinks their best hope now is Futomimi, who can perhaps divine information on Yuko, or at least what they can do for this world. He heads off now to Kabukicho, where there is a mantra prison to look for him, while the Demi-Fiend now checks in on Gozu Tenno. The mantra leader is confused how they overran the Nihilo base, and yet now they are hemorrhaging Magatsuhi and his army is quickly dying off. Its captured mannequin affirms it was a trick by the Nihilo and has a vision of the maiden being the nexus where the Magatsuhi gathers. She affirms the mantra are doomed, and defiant, Gozu Tenno states that while his body may die, his spirit will live on until another worthy of his power arrives. With this, his statue body crumbles, crushing the mannequin seer, and just outside, Thor admits the mantra have been defeated by their own hubris, and leaves on his own to find a place where the strong thrive. Leaving for Kabukicho prison, the Demi Fiend is ambushed on the highway by a hellbiker, forced to stop them in their tracks for another menorah. Entering the prison and working past the mirages within, the Demi Fiend finds the mannequin here are being drained of their magatsuhi. Getting help from the collector mannequin he met before, the Demi Fiend defeats the demon warden and frees the prisoners, wherein he is met by Futomimi, who recognizes him from a prophecy he made. He can indeed see into the near future, and already knew the half-human, half-demon boy would save them, and also knows his friend is trapped in here as well. He was caught trying to free him, but Futomimi adds there is a strange energy inside of him. Freeing Isamu nearby, the Demi Fiend finds him studying the Amala drum, and then reacting to him in a strangely angry tone. Feeling rejected, Isamu states he learned he cannot depend on his friends or their teacher anymore, and since no one cares about him, it's up to him to survive in this world alone. Resonating with the Amala drum, he mentions he also heard a voice when he entered this world, asking him to seek the truth, and he now realizes, truth isn't something other people give you, it's something you find within yourself. Figuring out a way to the Amala network on his own, he feels power and truth are within it, claiming to hear a voice calling him there and disappearing within it. Leaving now, the demi Fiend runs into Futomimi again, who says he will lead his people somewhere else where they will not have to suffer anymore. He also thanks the boy one more time with a prophecy, saying there was a man waiting for him at Ginza and should go now. Listening, the demi Fiend finds Hijiri there, who shares he has already learned of Ikawa's exploits, and suggests they find where the Nightmare System is or the Maiden running it. To search without raising alarms, he needs a terminal not under control by Nihilo already, and thinks of the mannequins rebuilding a town of Asakusa as a new home for themselves. As there is likely a Nihilo free terminal there, Hajiri asks the Demi Fiend to go to Asakusa and establish a connection there so he can travel safely, and agreeing, the boy heads off. Dealing with the Onis plaguing the subway tunnels leading to Asakusa, despite their tempting offer, he takes a detour into the labyrinth of Amala, manures in hand. Tricks, traps, and hazards riddle the aptly named labyrinth as beyond the first layer of the maze, the Demi Fiend is met by the old man and lady in black again. The lady repeats how one man caused the conception of the old world, the vortex world is a result, and Kagutsuchi is the source of power that illuminates this world and will empower the one it chooses to determine the course and creation of the new world. However, this vortex world is not unique, as there is actually a vast Amala universe where Kagutsuchi rises, matures, and falls in countless other worlds. The endless waltz of life, death, and rebirth of billions of worlds is the way of Amala, and per the order of the Great Will. No world has yet figured out why the rebirth cycle is there to begin with, but the old man feels he is on the verge of finding an answer, and the demi Fiend will be the key. As the boy continues down to the next level, a noble voice rings out of nowhere, calling him out as an accomplice to the fallen angel Lucifer, and not even knowing the cause he is furthering. The voice warns him he is about to defy God's will and lose his human heart to darkness, but the demi Fiend instead chooses to stay the course, one more god rejected. Clearing the second capilla, the Lady in Black further elaborates that the many wandering spirits lingering about the labyrinth are people still clinging onto the past despite their death, and many of those have had dealings with Ikawa. Revealing his past, he explains the Ring of Gaia was a cult that absorbed all doctrines, believing the truth was somewhere among the chaos. Even within that inclusive group, Hikawa was regarded as a heretic, as he believed his ideal world was not to be found, but to be made by his own hands. Within the ring's library was a scripture of Moroku, through which he was able to construct an Amala drum, and through that, discover the Amala universe. Hikawa then learned of the fated destruction of the world called the Conception, and preparing immediately, summoned demons to kill all who opposed him, both the Gaian and Messiah groups, including the murders at Yoyogi Park. Finally, he then formed the Assembly of Nihilo to aid him in creation after the Conception occurred. 
Though it seems Hikawa is the closest to realizing creation, she points out the future is not set just yet, suggesting the world can even be freed from the seemingly perpetual cycle of creation. Moving on, the Demi-Fiend is approached by the next set of Minora contenders, the Four Horsemen, who add they also serve the Fallen Angel in an effort to rise above the cycle. They also mention their leader wishes to have only one demon left standing in this ordeal, and that demon will lead his army to the final battle, informing the Demi-Fiend that succeeding here will cost him the rest of his humanity. Accepting this, they take their duel to the Vortex world, where the aggressive White Rider and Red Rider are the first to approach and first to fall to the boy. Arriving in Asakusa, the Demi-Fiend is surprised to find Hijiri already waiting for him there, as he was able to figure out the route to the terminal on his own after all. While he was waiting, he also found out mannequins are actually made nearby, from black mud scooped up from the riverbank, so it makes sense why they regard this town as their home. He then confirms this terminal is outside Nihilo's surveillance, so he can use it to keep tabs on them and the Nightmare System. Looking around town, the Demi-Fiend is asked to go see Futomimi in their holy land of Mifunashiro, and doing so learns the leader is meditating on what can be done so the mannequins can live peaceably in this world. Though, Futomimi also warns the Demi-Fiend to beware a mannequin named Sakahagi, a traitor and murderer among their people, still stalking nearby the town. Investigating, the Demi-Fiend follows a trail of bloodshed to Sakahagi, killing other mannequins to collect their Magatsuhi and collecting the skins of his victims to wear. Seeing the Demi-Fiend, he brags he will soon have enough Magatsuhi to even control demons, quickly moving on. Checking back with Hajiri, he shows the Demi-Fiend what he sees in the Amalodrome, a huge obelisk in Chiyoda gathering Magatsuhi at its peak, where the Nightmare System is actually located. As the Maiden is likely they're operating it, time is running out to prevent Hikawa from taking over the world. Sneaking into the obelisk and challenging the three Mori sisters of fate, the Demi-Fiend finds Yuko suspended and being used as a conduit to gather Magatsuhi. Quickly freeing her and shutting down the Nightmare System, she thanks him for saving her, embarrassed that she had to be, and mad at herself for blindly following Hikawa like a fool. She shares her dream of an ideal world where people are grateful to be alive, unlike the previous world full of selfish, self-entitled people who took no accountability or responsibility for their own or the world's problems, yet pretending they were fine despite their miserable complacency. She's not surprised she got manipulated by Hikawa, but she does not agree with his reason either. Yuko then says there is still time to fix things, and she found a goddess who could set things right, allowing herself to become possessed by the unknown goddess. The being addresses the boy as a fool bearing the name Freedom, introducing herself as Aradia, hailing from the far reaches of Amala, and here to bestow freedom. She promises a world of light, but also one of darkness, and championing liberty, insists the Demi-Fiend do whatever they think is right and not obey others. Aradia then disappears with Yuko, and soon after, the little boy and old woman appear, commenting on Aradia's arrival. They also share things are coming to a head, where now those who wish to spread their reason will soon begin to war amongst themselves. As a demon, the Demi-Fiend is not allowed to conceive his own reason, however, he can lend his support to one. Thinking on this, the Demi-Fiend returns to Hijiri, who confirms the flow of Magatsuhi is normalized and Hikawa's progress is staggered. Hijiri then updates the Demi-Fiend that he met his friend Isamu inside the Amala network, and warns that staying there as long as he is can risk one getting absorbed by the network itself. He comments how in this world, one life doesn't amount to much and human relationships are pretty much non-existent, but all the same, he can send the boy to Asamu if he wants. Reflecting on this, the Demi-Fiend is approached by the Black Rider, confronting his judgement and claiming another menorah, and venturing into the next layer of the Labyrinth of Mala where his power is personally appraised. Deemed worthy to progress, the Demi-Fiend is then intercepted by Dante from Devil May Cry 2, who hit the jackpot in predicting his next move, explaining the old man is planning to have the fiends kill each other off, and the Demi-Fiend is just another pawn in that game. He doesn't know why, but warns the boy to get out now, but seeing the Demi-Fiend insists on moving ahead, begins a game of cat and mouse, chasing him throughout the labyrinth and forcing him into a fight. Impressed at the strength of the Demi-Fiend, Dante lands a warning blow, complimenting the boy, and smugly adding that killing him only helps the old man's plan. Letting the Demi-Fiend walk his own path, Dante from Devil May Cry 2 drops the job, saying he's free to figure things out on his own and takes his leave for a better sequel of his own. To the side, Raido has witnessed enough, preparing to intercede himself to end things, but Goto also tells him to stand down, while conveying to the boy Raido has actually been in his corner from the start. For some reason, they see a spark of hope in him and wish to lend him aid, handing him a menorah they also obtained, confident the boy is strong enough to forge on ahead and looking forward to the next meeting. Further in, the Lady in Black is impressed how well the Demi-Fiend was able to keep up with professionals like Dante from Devil May Cry 2 and Devil Summoner Raido. She also informs the boy about Aradia, who was a goddess from a wholly separate vortex world. 
To be more precise, in the shadow of this vortex world is another world where those considered fictitious gather, and that non-canon world is where Aradia once resided. Everyone from that world wishes for their existence to become real and the non-canon to be canon, and so seek out worlds that hold the power of creation for their chance. Aradia herself is the tragic savior born of dreams brought about by witches persecuted for their beliefs and who prayed for power and freedom. However, Aradia never showed nor saved anyone, could instead only give hope, and humans created by God had instead created a god of their own. But then, within the vast Amala universe, anything is possible, or arguably canon. But that doesn't change the fact that Aradia is an outsider, and her existence is forbidden here. With this in mind, the Demi-Fiend now visits Isamu, passing by several strongly voiced spirits who are glad to be left alone and consider themselves happily isolated and independent. Running into the same vengeful specter as before, the Demi-Fiend smashes past the obstacle, finding Isamu absorbing several souls of the same disposition into himself. Rising up, Isamu faces the Demi-Fiend, claiming the old him is dead and the new him is the master of the Amala network. Revealing he too is shirtless with a reformed body, he claims to have stopped caring about others, which is fine because he knows others do not care about him. He realizes everyone is the center of their own universes, and that's actually for the best as everyone would be happy in their own private paradise, in total control without outside interference. Naming his reason Musubi, he offers his world of isolation to his old friend whenever he gets tired of getting tossed around this world of chaos, wanting some time alone. Leaving the network, Kajiri says he saw what happened and can follow Isamu in the network, and in the meanwhile, the boy hears Futomimi is done meditating for his next prophecy, and Hikawa is at the old mantra headquarters. Catching Hikawa outside, Hikawa says he expected the Demi-Fiend to be strong, as it was foretold in the scripture of Moroku, but the boy has exceeded even his expectations. As such, he extends an offer to partner with him in realizing his reason, as he still has enough Magatsuhi on hand, promising a world of still serenity where mankind will no longer be its own worst enemy. While the Demi-Fiend does not commit to this, Hikawa mentions someone nearby is scheming to revive Gozu Tenno, and investigating, the Demi-Fiend learns from Hajiri that mannequins are planning something themselves. Checking on Futo Mimi, he has gathered the mannequins together to announce an evil power is taking shape at Yoyogi Park that threatens to take over the world and ruin the world the mannequins aim to create for themselves. Venturing there, the Demi-Fiend is halted by the final of the Four Horsemen, but even the Pale Rider cannot overcome his sheer might, foregoing his menorah. Arriving at Yoyogi Park, the Demi-Fiend learns Sakahagi has infiltrated the area and placed all of the fairies there under a spell. He also runs into Yugo, who says the reason so many are focused on the park is because a relic called the Yahiro no Himorogi, containing a tremendous amount of Magasuhi, is within. She also mentions the stone is rumored to have the power to control gods, and since Aradia has not told Yugo her reason yet, hopes obtaining this will prove herself worthy. She senses the stone is in the hands of someone very strong, so she makes a deal with the Demi-Fiend, in that if she gives him all of the Magatsuhi inside the stone, he'll give her the stone itself. Whether he agrees or not, she says she'll be on his side, as the Demi-Fiend navigates the traps of the tricky fairies to find Sakahagi with the Yahiro no Himorogi in hand. The mannequin says the boy isn't the first to try and claim it, as a girl just tried and failed just now. With a will to conquer all demons, even the Demi-Fiend before him, Sakahagi tries to carve the skin off of his foe, only to die failing to secure his ambition. Unfortunately, the Yahiro no Himorogi is completely empty of Magatsuhi, so the Demi-Fiend has the thanks of the fairies who allow him to keep the stone in return for freeing them from Sakahagi's curse. Returning the stone to Yugo, she is eager to learn her goddess's reason now, passing control to Aradia. However, the goddess speaks to the convictions of the Demi-Fiend instead, recognizing his strength and telling him another strength now rises in Ikebukuro, siding with Yuko, though Yuko is distraught the goddess still will not share her reason. She feels the need to look at what others are doing now to shape their worlds and leaves, as the Demi-Fiend now battles and defeats Mother Harlot lurking nearby for another menorah. Returning to Hajiri, he says he lost track of Isamu, believing he was completely absorbed by the network, but now the reporter speaks strangely about seizing control of Amala himself. Returning to Ikebukuro, the Demi-Fiend finds Chiaki wounded after having lost an arm to Sakahagi, and whose anger and thirst for power resonates with the lingering spirit of Gozu Tenno. Sharing the same vision of a world ruled by the strong, Gozu Tenno approves Chiaki's reason and gives the last of his power to her, as she suddenly grows a new arm and then mutates into a half-demonic new form. She loves her new look and power, and is ready to lead like-minded demons to her cause. Dealing with an overly ambitious Black Frost drunk on newfound power, the Demi-Fiend finds Hajiri in a similar state, now bragging he sees all and knows all with the power of Amala and the Terminals. He reveals he already knows about Gozu Tenno and Chiaki, that Hikawa is en route to the Diet Building in search of Magatsuhi, the mannequins of Mufi and Ashiro are demanding their own reason, and there is an abandoned temple where a ton of Magatsuhi lies untouched. 
He then stops and says he's done being an investigator, as no one knows more about the Vortex world than him now, and because of this, he feels he is the only one with the right to reshape the new world. Hajiri exclaims he is the only one with the knowledge to improve this world, but suddenly the drum spins, and Hajiri recognizes this to be Isamu's work as he is pulled in unwillingly. Following him in, the Demi-Fiend is met by Isamu, who sardonically mentions he's doing him a favor, and invites him to Amala Temple just ahead where he'll explain how Hajiri is just taking advantage of him. The Ornery Spectre from before interrupts the Demi-Fiend, but it's the last mistake it ever makes, as the Demi-Fiend opens the temple and defeats three demons vying for the overwhelming collection of Magatsuhi here. As it turns out, all the Makatsuhi in the Amala network originates from here, as Isamu allows the Demi-Fiends into a central pyramid and shows him a captured Hajiri being used as a medium to collect all the hoarded Magatsuhi the Demi-Fiend just freed. As Isamu prepares the ritual for his reason, he mentions this idea actually came from Hajiri himself who was plotting to induce his own ritual, and Hajiri admits this to a point but is still defiant. With this, Isamu drops Hajiri into an abyss of Magatsuhi who quickly dissolves away and calls forth his god of absolute solitude drifting outside the flow of time, Noah. Surrounding himself inside Noah, Isamu leaves to enable his world of Musubi, and after he leaves, minions of Chiaki spy on and mention how she is on the move in Asakusa. Hurrying there, the Demi-Fiend finds several mannequins slaughtered as Chiaki has gone to destroy Futomimi and receive approval for her reason. The angels here all mock the mannequins, dismissing them as mud people trying their hand at creating an altruistic world without hierarchy where all share happiness regardless of potential. Walking in on Chiaki, killing the last of the mannequins here, she tells Futomimi the weak have no right to dream of power, and as he turns to the Demi-Fiend for help, she tells the boy wasting his power, serving the weak, forfeits his right to inherit the world with the strong. She distracts him with her entourage of archangels while proceeding to kill Futomimi and then takes all the Magatsuhi he was storing here. Having what she needs now, she calls down her god, transforming into Baal Avatar, who declares her arrival, while already sensing Noah and now sensing something rising in Ginza. After Baal leaves, the Demi-Fiend is waylaid by the final menorah holder, Trumpeter, who after defeat instructs him to meet their master at the bottom of the labyrinth now. Doing so, the Demi-Fiend meets the lost souls of both Futomimi and Sakahagi among a cursed layer of the labyrinth and give them peace in the afterlife, soon arriving at the hall of the Wicked King and Warden of Souls, Beelzebub. He mentions how the Demi-Fiend isn't even aware of the true mission of Lucifer in creating a new demon of chaos and is here to be the last test before gathering all the menorahs. Assuming his true form, the Lord of Flies falls to Lucifer's favorite as the boy triumphs again and revisits his patrons. The Lady in Black first mentions how mannequins are made of fragments of human emotions that gain physical form and become sentient. When all humans were purged during the conception, the souls and emotions of many still lingered. The strongest emotions, good or bad, sought new vessels and merged with the earth to take new forms called mannequins. Their fate is a haunted curse, as they don't know creation is forbidden to them and will not be allowed to exist in any new reborn world, regardless of the will and power of exceptions like Futomimi and Sakahagi. Back to the main point, she acknowledges all of the menorahs have been restored, revealing the menorahs were actually never stolen but rather distributed to fiends of death meant to test those worthy before being brought to the grand battle of light and darkness that has been waged across the universe beyond the scope of time. However, determined to end the eternal war, one person decided to create a demon of chaos that would inherit his will and combat the forces of light. Between the fiends and Labyrinth, Demi-Fiend has proven himself, and so they directly ask him to lead the Army of Darkness, reminding him to consider doubts about the laws of the universe or God's interference in it. If he accepts, then he is asked to visit the bottom of the Labyrinth where he will shed his human heart and be born again a full demon, body and soul. The Lady in Black then ends with a story about Hajiri, who actually died in the Conception, yet persisted in the Vortex world. Reason being, Hajiri was carrying the burden of a mortal sin he committed in the past and the punishment would not allow him the release of death and so he carried on his atonement in the next world. His punishment was to witness everything that happens in the world and record the war of order versus chaos in its entirety, forever. Hajiri would not be allowed to influence his next life with karma and though he was given the body of a mannequin in the vortex world, even though that was destroyed, his soul would have remained unsaved and will continue on, cursed to eternal life. He was not even made aware he died in the old world, much less his sin or punishment, and unaware that by helping the Demi-Feed, he was actually fulfilling his cursed destiny. His soul will now travel to a new land to suffer again, unable to be freed and unforgiven for his sin. With this, she mentions the Demi-Feed has the option to enable a predestined outcome, or make his own fate, trailblazing with demons. 
Considering his options, the Demi-Fiend is then met by Raido and Goto again, who comment his power is worthy of the Kuzunoa clan too, but it'll only get harder for him from here. As such, in the face of the coming battle, Raido offers to partner up with the Demi-Fiend, and accepting, the Devil Summoner admits this may be their biggest case yet, but will fight to protect the capital regardless. In addition, the power of the Demi-Fiend's bond with the stoutest ally, Pixie, manifests in an incredible boost of power for her, and she also commits to walk forward with him. Walking with firm allies, the Demi-Fiend now moves to confront Hikawa on the Diet Building, as he now summons his god. Demonic statues ward the halls riddled with optical illusions, as the Demi-Fiend walks in on Yuko confronting Hikawa already. Hikawa points out freedom is just a front for wholesale corruption, and there was plenty of that in the old world already, so if she really believed in the concept, she would not have even pursued creation in the first place, and has no right to judge others. Her actions were as aimless as her notion of bringing students of hers here only to fail like her. He explains the reason she has been unable to obtain her reason is because she keeps running away and doesn't really believe in freedom. As Yugo is unable to reply, Aradia now comes out, claiming Hikawa's choice is a freedom of its own, but ignoring the goddess, Hikawa mentions she is powerless in this warded area as prepared for his own god. Seeing she is lost, Aradia tells Yuko they need to run away to another world now, but Yuko chooses to stay, and so Aradia runs away on her own. Mocking the useless false god, Hikawa turns to sacrifice Yugo to finish the ritual, as the room is claimed by the Void, and the Demi-Fiend cannot save Yugo while Hikawa merges with his god, Aramon. The lingering thoughts of Yugo reach the Demi-Fiend, as she tells him she does feel that while it did not work out for this world, there must be a world out there where freedom does prevail. She wasn't strong enough or worthy, but the Demi-Fiend is, and insists he use the Yahiro no Himurogi at Amala Temple to create a better world. The stone will be the key to Kagutsuchi, and it's not too late to create a world of freedom if he so desires. Making final preparations, the Demi-Fiend helps summon one of the longest and strongest demons, Mara, beats a puzzle game at a restored arcade, and uses a sword and a stone to earn the help of the old guard of Tokyo, ready to defend it regardless of what world it is. Then, journeying to the very bottom of the labyrinth of Mamala, the Demi-Fiend is halted before the final door by the voice he heard before who knows his intent and refuses to allow it. Metatron reveals himself, declaring judgment has come for the Demi-Fiend, and he shall drink in the wine of the Wrath of God, but the new champion of chaos does not crack before God's warrior of light. Victorious, the old man and lady in black welcome him, as all demons celebrate the birth of the new demon of darkness who will join the fallen angel and defeat the Absolute One. Before this though, the Demi-Fiend must return to the Vortex world and defeat the three humans vying for control in Kagutsuchi itself. As their final gift, they grant him the heart of a demon now too, as the Demi-Fiend is now gently dropped into the pool below to the approval of Lucifer to be reborn as a true demon. Waking up in the morgue of the hospital again, the Demi-Fiend returns to the Temple of Amala and places the Yahiro no Himurogi upon his stand, and the bright light in the sky, Kagutsuchi, now speaks, declaring the way to creation is now open. It sends down a pillar to connect to the obelisk, and before ascending, the Demi-Fiend considers the world of freedom Yugo mentioned before she died. Perhaps if he did go along with it, the world would actually go back to how things were preconception. The world would have its problems, but it would also have the potential for solutions too. His friends and allies would go back to being normal, but this time, the hopelessness they felt about themselves would not be extended to the world, and they would overcome it by changing themselves within and moving forward. Otherwise, of the options before him, the option to support no one also exists. He considers that were he to do that, while he would surely be scorned by God for leaving the world unborn with no reason to exist, he would likely gain the approval of the demons here who will now have a world of their own without light for millennia to come. He is snapped to attention by the young boy and old woman who observed the Demi-Fiend has chosen to live as a demon after all, and will also join him on the final battleground. As he prepares to climb Kagusuchi's tower, Kagusuchi isn't thrilled to see his heart is full of darkness, and instead of making a choice to remake the world, has rejected the concept of a choice at all. The Demi-Fiend faces Hikawa and Aramon, shattering the silence they seek, and prevailing, Hikawa at least thanks him for delivering the stillness of death to him all the same. Next, he breaks his old friend Isamu alongside Noah outside their idyllic dream world, though Isamu dies, still cursing the boy. Finally, the Demi-Fiend destroys the mighty Thor before contesting his strength against Chiaki and Baal Avatar, who fully support a duel to the death. Chiaki is crushed, and as she dies broken, is baffled as to why someone who has claimed such strength would not agree with her reason. With nothing between himself and Kagutsuchi now, the entity laments that all reasons have been destroyed now, and one who has lost all humanity has ruined any chance this world had of evolution or rebirth. 
furious and seeks to purge the Demi-Fiend, and during battle, reveals itself to actually be another avatar of the Great Will, who wanted this world to be among the countless many stuck in the Rebirth Cycle until it becomes a world of law they approve of. Struck down without grace, Kagusuchi says the Demi-Fiend, like Hajiri, will now never be forgiven and his soul will never know rest, especially after he fights and falls in the final battle. As Kakuzuchi's light leaves the world, the Demi-Fiend wakes up in darkness, greeted by the young boy and old woman again, who recognizes he has unshackled the world from its cycle. Their shadows reach long to form into the old man and lady in black, who add when the cycle stops, so does time itself. He confirms the Great Will will curse him, but not to worry, as the path of conquest now lies before him. For the final test, his opponent will be the supreme being of darkness created by the Great Will himself, revealing his young and old shadows merging together to reform Lucifer himself. Pushed to his limit, the Demi-Fiend and his friends pass the grueling trial and afterwards receives the approval of Lucifer personally. As the game ends, Lucifer ushers all followers of darkness to rally behind the new demon of chaos as his eyes glow red and he marches towards the final battle. Case closed, Raido and Goto return to their original world, and mention while their original mission was to slay the Demi-Fiend, they found this was just one part of a greater plan to stage a massive war between Light and Darkness in the future capital. Seeking to prevent this war, their best ally may actually be the Demi-Fiend himself, but only time will tell. Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne has enjoyed the success of selling over 770,000 copies worldwide. Thank you for watching this recap, I hope it helps some of you enjoy what some would call a real Shin Megami Tensei game, but there will be more to come. Subscribe for more recaps like this, share with someone who could use it, and shout out to the patrons and channel members. If you like what you see, I would appreciate you becoming a patron or channel member yourself, links in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next battlefield.